So good afternoon, um, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to this ninth in the series of BioBiz uh, webinars from IUCN. Um, my name is Nadine McCormick. Um, next slide, please, Ella. My name is Nadine McCormick. I'm with the IUCN uh, Business and Biodiversity Program. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, it's actually our final webinar that we're going to do in the series at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, the theme that we're excited to share with you today is the theme of multi-stakeholder partnerships with business for conservation. It's actually... Um, we did a survey of the IUCN conservation community earlier in the year, and it was the top need that came out in that survey. So we're really happy to be able to focus on this issue for our final in the series. Next slide, please. So the, the common thread across all the webinars, aside from business engagement, have also been the use of um, learning from case studies. And those case studies can all be found on Panorama Solutions. And so for those of you who don't know about Panorama Solutions already, it is a, an amazing treasure trove of case studies, now more than 600 available across different challenges. Um, and so in the theme of be, uh, business engagement, there are now more than 60 um, business engagement solutions that are there to inspire you to um, uh, also to connect you with individuals who've done something perhaps similar, a similar challenge to you in the past. So next slide. And so, as I mentioned, there's been eight previous webinars before each of them, we've tackled a different question that had come up at the time. There's a whole range of subject matters you can find on our web page where we've got all the recordings, the slides and summaries available to you. Everything from, um, you know, how do I start conversations with business? How do I, you know, get financing to flow in our conservation projects with business? How looking at nature based solutions in business and business and uh, legal frameworks and many other themes that have emerged through questions and, and discussions with some of our IUCN members who are looking to work with business. So I highly recommend you, you look at some of those previous resources that are all available to you there. Next slide. So it's important we do some Zoom essentials, especially for those of you who are just joining the webinar now, you're very welcome. Uh, for the first time, we are using um, uh, Zoom. We've been previously using GoToWebinar. And I have to admit, um, after our last webinar three months ago, we normally have amazing feedback. And the feedback from the last one was a bit lower. And when you looked at the questions, it was really this expectation now that we you know we should also be providing webinars in French and Spanish as well. We are the, the three official languages of IUCN. So we rose to the challenge with the help of Juan Carlos and Francis who are interpreting for those now. So to hear those interpretations, as you've probably found already, you need to click on the world symbol identify the language that you would like to listen in um, and then um, and then uh, yes select that language I would also recommend mute original audio and as Ella's just said in the chat box if you are, are having any issues please do let us know sometimes it's because you don't have the most up-to-date version of zoom so if you're it's really not working one suggestion is actually just to leave the call update your Zoom on your computer and then come back in and hopefully it will work. We'll keep an eye on the waiting room to let you back in. Um, and um, and then the other thing is just to say, um, yeah, as usual, you can feel free to use the chat uh, function as well. Oh, I just see, uh, yeah, our first message, bonjour tout le monde. We haven't worked out how to uh, interpret the chat messages. Uh, <laughs> so actually what we might do for questions that come later, if you ask them through the chat box, what we'll do is I'll use, well, I speak French, I don't speak Spanish, I'll use some Google Translate to see. And then what we'll do is we'll call on you to then say your question out loud. Um, please make sure that you are in the, the appropriate language channel when you're speaking, even if you speak all three languages. 
Um, and then the other feature that we're going to use with Zoom today are the breakout room functions as well. So I'm going to keep reminding you um, that if you are not going to join a breakout room today in an hour's time, please send me a private message to say, I'm sorry, I can't make it, then I won't include you. I just need that for planning purposes. I'm going to be behind the scenes setting up breakout rooms in um, French and in Spanish and in English so you have a chance to connect with everybody else. So with that, I think I shall be handing over to Ella, my colleague. Ella, um, you can change to the next slide. Make sure that I can hear you. Hello, everyone. Can you hey, hear me? I can yes. hear you loud and clear. Right. Ella, thank you. So I'm going to hand over the reins to Ella, um, who's going to moderate today's session. And uh, yeah, please be patient with us. It's our first time that we've used Zoom uh, and the first time for the break the audio channels and the breakout room. So we're going to try our best for you because uh, we listen to your feedback and uh, we, we, yeah, we want to make this the best experience as we can for a final webinar in this series. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ella um, to go walk you through the agenda and the rest of the session today. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Nadine. So hello, everyone. So Nadine has given us a short introduction on why we focused on multi-stakeholder partnerships for this webinar. So we will shortly pass to Herman Brewer, Senior Advisor on Multi-Stakeholder Processes in Food Security at Vernin Center for Development Innovation. So they're really leading on this topic and have actually released a multi-stakeholder partnerships guide in English, French, and Spanish. And so all the relevant documentation is available in the slides that are coming right up, which you will have access to later. So since there's no point reinventing the wheel, we decided to invite Herman to enlighten us on this concept. So after Herman, we will hear from two speakers who are just as amazing. So usually we like to provide examples of organizations who have successfully applied the tool or the concept that we're discussing. And in the IUCN survey on influencing business, which Nadine mentioned, we asked responders to provide one example of their most successful conservation projects. And out of more than 200 responses to that particular question, we extracted these really two great case studies of organizations who are very intelligently using multi-stakeholder partnerships to advance on their conservation goals. So we will hear later from Jaime Nalvarte Armas, director of the Peruvian NGO EDE, which translates into Association for Research and Integral Development, who will present his project um, on public-private partnership managing model, an alternative to recover degraded areas and biodiversity conservation for protected natural areas. And we're also very glad and honored to say that Ede is an IUCN member. So thank you, Jaime, for agreeing to speak with us. So after Jaime, we will hear from Carla Daneluti from the IUCN Center for Mediterranean Cooperation, who will present the Mediterranean Experience of Ecotourism Meat Project. So we're very grateful to have Carla on this call. And after their presentations, we will have another Q&A and then we will go into breakout rooms where you can discuss with um, your peers on your main highlights and how you would apply it to your context. But as Nadine said, if you're not able to participate in the second part of the webinar, please send her uh, a private message to her right now. Thank you. All right, so as you can see, Nadine, there's, do you... There's bad news, Ella, on the polls. Um, I admit I forgot to set them up, but I still would like to do them. So I just okay. need some time. So let's come back to the polls um, after Herman's presentation. Yeah. All right. Okay, that works. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead with our first presentation then. But before I move on, I just wanted to check with our participants. Is everyone all right? Do you have any questions so far? And if you're having any issues with the interpretation or anything else, please drop us a quick message in the chat and we will try to resolve it as quickly as possible. We do encourage participants to please leave any questions that you have for Herman, our first presenter in the chat so that we can address them as soon as the presentation ends. So Herman, if you are ready, I can now show your slides. Okay.
minutes, je vais vous parler comment engager les entreprises dans un partenariat multi-acteurs ou multi-participants. So a lot of what we've learned over the last decade or so, or 15 years, is really about how to put the academic knowledge about multi-stakeholder partnerships um, into practice, and also to do action learning and action research uh, with our partners all over the world in order to learn what works, what doesn't work. And, um, you know, I will be sharing with you some of our insights. Next. So what you see here is at the left side is a book that I wrote with a couple of colleagues. And um, if you see the link below, uh, the full PDF version of this uh, book is available, both in English, French, and Spanish. Um, I will be giving you kind of the gist of it in the next couple of minutes. It's really about how to design and facilitate multi-stakeholder partnerships. And we work both with civil society, with government, with academia, and also with private sector. We'd like to have our, our foot in different uh, areas, different domains, so that we can act a little bit as a border crosser or as a bridge between different sectors. So that's really the place that we are in. Next. Of course, if we specifically talk about engaging the private sector, assuming that most of you are working either with civil society or, in, or with government or with semi-government organizations, then you, know, you probably have run into the question why it is so hard to engage private sector. And of course, one, one answer to that is of course that um, you really need to do effort to understand uh, how private sector thinks and operates. And there are three components to that that I briefly want to touch upon. One of them is, of course, that the core business models that the private sector uses are very different from the ways of thinking and also operating of many other organizations. And you need to really kind of figure it out. Um, what we often recommend is working with a business model canvas to really drill down what some of the drivers are for private sector to do what they do and also to see where that perhaps conflicts with, uh, with your own way of working and seeing also where there might be opportunities to collaborate. Secondly, you also need to understand how companies and investors look at risk and increasingly long-term risks. That's also what, for example, World Bank studies have shown, uh, really indicate that companies should be concerned about their long-term risks if they're not, uh, if they don't have processes in place for responsible agricultural investment, for example, or for biodiversity conservation. So there's really an opportunity there to kind of talk with them about what's your risk protocol, uh, et cetera, and how can we work together for you to become more resilient in the future? And thirdly, it's also good to understand the value, other value generation motives of the private sector. This implies that not all companies are just about profit. Uh, of course, finance is, is the ulterior, ulterior motivator, uh, usually, but increasingly you see companies who also want to deliver other types of value and are open in ways on how to action that. Next. And, you know, the, in the previous slides, of course, there are some ideas that you can think about or that you can find out for yourself about how private sector things and works and how you could partner with them. Uh, but in my experience, there's a lot of process issues that are not so much about thinking smart, but are also about who you are your, about uh, yourself and how you engage with others that are really making or breaking potential partnerships. And I'm showing you this slide because it shows you how different sectors typically think about each other. And if you look at some of the classifications that are there in the, uh, in the green boxes, you see that they're actually quite negative. You know, if you think about, um, for example, the government, a lot of people think about government, that they are bureaucratic, that they are dogmatic, that they're inflexible and controlling. At the same time, for business, there are similar negative qualifications. Also for NGOs, negative qualifications. These are not things that are often 
said out loud, but they are in the, in the, in the heads of people. And if you really want to um, work with other sectors, you also need to recognize that some of these stereotypes or assumptions, even though they may be true, that they are also living within us as well and that we need to recognize them. Next. So basically the bottom line is if we can't get beneath these stereotypes, there is little chance of building a genuine partnership. Next. And of course, if we talk about partnerships, we can get into a long discussion about uh, definitions, which I will not go into. We see that many, many initiatives, organizations have different names for it. I've just put some names that I often see uh, on the screen. Some of them more popular with NGOs, some of them more popular with private sector. Um, effectively, we, we often see exactly the same principles that are underlying the success of these initiatives. So regardless of the name, I'd like to talk, take you further by talking a little bit more about some of the underlying principles that make MSPs effective. Next. And what you see here is basically the table of content of the MSP guide that I described. So I'm going to share with you a little bit in the, in the blue section about four phases of MSPs. And after that, I'm going to finish off with talking about the seven principles that help make MSPs successful. Next. Now, first of all, here is a, a model that we often use to, to help people really think through what uh, stages or phases MSPs typically have. Of course, there, there's always variations, but generally they follow the pattern that there is an initiating group, that's the big arrow, where a couple of people think, well, wouldn't it be a good idea if we would work together on this issue, which is basically a challenge for everybody and that nobody can solve alone. From there, the initiative builds to an adaptive planning phase, collaborative action phase, and a reflective monitoring phase. And there's all, all these arrows going back and forth because it's not very much a linear process. But in the MSP guide, you can find guidance on things that you can do in each of these phases. Next. Now I'm going to talk you through seven principles. The first one is about embracing systemic change. This is really about recognizing that when you're dealing with complex problems, um, it often works almost the same as in nature. There are no linear processes. That, and as a, um, an NGO or even as a business or government, you're not in control. So how do you work if you're not in control? That is taking a systemic perspective. And that's something that you really need if you want to work in partnerships effectively. Next. Secondly, we like to emphasize that it is important to change and transform the institutions that underlie many of the patterns of behavior um, that happen in partnerships. And when we talk about institutions, it's not necessarily about a government institution or something like that. They can also be the way how we do things the informal rules of the game that, that inform how certain uh, uh, situations or inequalities are being kept in place and are not moving. Trying to transform them is a matter often of decades. But if you're not aware of them, then you know, you, you're, you're not likely to be very successful. Next. Another principle is about working with power and recognizing that not everybody has the same power base. And so how do you design processes that somehow also give voice to people who don't have power, who give access to people who do not have power and do that in a way that is respectful and effective for everybody uh, and accepted also by everybody. That is a challenge and uh, but there are ways how you can work towards that. Next. The fourth one is about dealing with conflict. And personally, I don't like conflict myself. I'm a conflict avoider. Um, but in many of the partnerships that I've worked with, uh, I've seen, I hear stories about successes where people tell stories that the success was only possible because they also experienced quite a bit of conflict 
and we're able to overcome that. So it's not about avoiding conflict necessarily, but sometimes also conflict can help a partnership to move forward if it's held well or mediated well. Next. Another principle is about enabling effective communication. And of course, this is obvious. You know, if you don't, don't understand each other's language or cultural habits, etc., then you're not likely to get your message across or to listen to what people are saying. And um, I've chosen this picture of uh, a boat race in Cambodia because you can, you can see that for both the people inside the boat, there's lots of communication needed. So it's internal communication in the partnership in a way, but also the boats need to communicate with the other boats in order to avoid accidents. So there's external communication as well. That's really important. Next. Promoting collaborative leadership is critical because it means that you uh, accept that leadership doesn't reside just in one person alone. So it's really important to recognize that there are often very different leadership resources in the team. And the broader the team becomes, it also, you, you've got more resources at your disposal. Um, so that's, uh, that's helpful. Doesn't mean that there is no boss or that there's no kind of chain of command somewhere in partnerships. We need very clear rules of engagement and a very clear chairmanship, et cetera. But still, this is something to aim for. Next. The final one is about fostering participatory learning. And this is not learning like in a classroom where you just receive information and practice your skills. We think of learning more as a process of joint sense making. And this is really an essential part of helping you to get rid of some of your stereotypes about other sectors and also kind of finding out about other perspectives on the issue that you're trying to address. Next. So in summary, these are the, the seven, and there's a whole section in the book that is devoted to uh, certain tools and ideas and tips on how to put them into practice. Next. So um, I think we've come to the end of our presentation. Uh, this is um, uh, um, a book that also has a guidebook um, as well that you can find on the website. So. There's about 60 tools or so that we have found very useful. And if you're interested, then you can find more there. Uh, so I think I'd leave it at this for the given the time and give back to Ella. All right. Thank you, Herman, for this. Uh -oh. You're good. I can hear you. OK, thank you. All right. So thank you, Herman, for this really great presentation. I really liked your point about learning how to manage conflict. I think it's one of those soft skills that we sometimes neglect to, to really nourish. So thank you for, for bringing that up. So really great presentation with beautiful images. All right, so we're going to pause here for now and gather any questions that people might have. So I'm going to check in the chat now if we have any, any questions. So currently I see that we don't have any questions. So please keep them coming. Let's um, give some questions to, to Herman. But so in the meantime, we did receive some questions um, in the registration form. So maybe the people who asked them if they have joined the call, maybe they can you know, provide any comments to um, Herman's answers. So the first question is from Abdel Hadi from Morocco. So he asked um, how to make the partnership model comply with laws and strategies of all countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, um, yes, that's a difficult question because nowadays I see a lot of partnerships that are, um, that are not national, but actually are broader than national. They are regional or even global in nature. But of course, if you're in a country and you, um, uh, you want to ensure that your partnership has proper legal status. We, there's many, many different models. The one that is, and it, of course, it depends per country. What I often see is that a partnership initiative is, ho is hosted by another organization that acts like a backbone organization. And a backbone organization basically means 
that it's the organization that's providing the secretariat or the administrative support and therefore also can provide some of the legal kind of requirements. Um, I've also seen very, very informal partnerships that, um, that are not registered legally. Um, but particularly when we are talking about partnership or multi-stakeholder partnerships that involve the private sector and also the public sector, we see that those informal partnerships usually evolve into a more formal status as well. Um, and sometimes they even become separate organizations or initiatives that get, get registered in, in their own right. Of course, this depends on uh, country legislation uh, and so on. So there's different ways of doing it. Uh, and there are some models which are actually not in this guide. But um, if you're interested, I can, uh, I can share some information with IUCN later. OK, that sounds really great. That would be very helpful. We have the emails of the participants, so we can definitely forward that also. So we had a, a second question, actually, also um, that came in the registration forms. So it was from Pedro from Spain, who was asking about how to sign collaboration agreements. So that question is very interesting, um, especially for me also. I, um, I was on a previous um, call where someone asked kind of the same question. So asking if, you know, collaboration agreements, do they have to be formal? Can they be informal? And what um, are the elements that you should really watch out for? So yeah, if you have any insight on yeah, that. Yeah. No, that's, that's a very, very good question. And I, I've seen a lot of confusion arising from different expectations around partnering agreements. Because in many organizations, um, what, when they start engaging business, the first thing they want to do is sign an MOU. And MOU usually means a, a memorandum of understanding that you go to the top of the organization, to the CEO or to the board or whoever, and try to get something signed on a very, very high level. This, of course, is helpful because then in your organization, you've got the mandate to actually engage and spend your time in building this partnership. But for a lot of companies and also government agencies, they don't like to kind of sign something if they, if they don't know exactly what is, what is happening. So they would rather sign MOUs if there's already some collaboration going on or if the partnership is in fact already doing something uh, and the MOUs come after that. So it's the, the order in which you plan this process of formalization that really, really matters because in some sectors, it's really not appreciated if you go to the big boss straight away and, and get an MOU. Now, on the question of partnering agreements, that's an interesting one, because quite often this is kind of delegated to the legal department that then thinks as if, you know, as if this is a kind of a contract. And, um, you know, so then immediately there is, there are requirements and there are you know, all kind of clauses, legal clauses that are sometimes very frightening to read. Um, there are budget discussions. And I also often think that it's much more sensible to start with a partnering agreement, which is not so much about the money, but is about joint expectations and about joint aspirations. And then um, we often use this as a tool to really, um, um, get to know each other better instead of, you know, hammering the legal details down. So if you can find a way how to postpone involving the legal department, the better it is, I would say. Okay, that sounds really great. Thank you so much, Herman. So actually, we're, we're going to have to move on. We have, we see two questions, but we're going to um, save them for a later Q&A if that is okay. All right, so now that you are hopefully practically experts in MSPs, thanks to Herman, we are now going to see how they're applied in two projects. So our first one will be from Jaime, the director of the Peruvian NGO EDE. Once again, we encourage you to leave any questions that you have for our presenters in the chat while they're speaking, and we will address them during the Q&A session. So as a reminder, for those of you who prefer to listen in English, you may need to switch now to the English channel because Jaime will be speaking in Spanish. So Jaime, if you are ready, 
I will hand it over to you right now. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. As it has been well stated, I'm going to explain to you our management, our management experience in private public cooperation. This is a work that I've carried out in a multidisciplinary fashion. And we have worked with interdisciplinary teams within our IDA family. And ourselves, we are convinced and we are very committed to the associative model between civil society, private corporations, and governmental organizations. In that sense, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Next. In that sense, in the year 2003, when this experience was came to light, in Peru, 290,000 hectares were deforested. We lost 290,000 hectares. 290,000 hectares due to different drivers. And they were lost due to migra migrational agriculture, illegal woodcutting, uh, illegal crops, migrations, illegal minery, and uh, soil trafficking. In that sense, the story starts this year, the year 2003, when in a very casual way, I hear a conversation at the airport in the city of Ugayali, where this project is being carried out. And I hear a businessman of the Amazons in which he was commenting that he had 2,000 hect 2, hectares of degraded area of a total forest of 14,000 or 16,000 hectares to be exact. So in other words, he had 14,000 hectares with forest, with primary forest and, a secondar and secondary forest. And his forest had been impoverished by 2,000 hectares. And he didn't know what to do with that land. And he was very scared of the invasions of the of settlers in his land. And in that sense, I proposed to him in my quality as direct executive director of IDA and a partner as a partner, a founding partner of IDA 34 years ago, to be exact, is an NGO, a Peruvian NGO. And I proposed an alliance with this corporation to recover the degraded uh, land through the using different technologies and to reforest that hectares so to and to sell the production and with the production of that part of the forest to recover degraded areas to have a cash flow and to be able to conduct business and to guarantee sustainability of the surface in question and it's and to protect the totality and this is a way how the challenges rises to work with private corporation in the Amazon area and Ida as a civil a civil a civil society and the regional go government of Ukuyaya, these are and the private corporations, which are three important actors or to finalize a project of 100 hectares at the beginning, which had 100 hectares which had been divided which had been degraded. The idea was to have the technological package and knowledge to recover land and to plant spe commercial species, which can be, which are adapted to the social needs and to somehow produce a cash flow, to produce finance. In that sense, in, my, in, the proposal, in this proposal and the alliance, which is founded for the first time between private company, the regional government, and the company is called Bosques Amazonicos, the civil society, IDAR, and the regional government of Ucayaya, we launched this model of activity. And what was the solution? The solution is an approach, an approach 
of a co-financing model in which we sell the future production of that forest. This was a pilot test for the degraded area. And the idea was to have the technological um, package or tools to recover the ground, the soil, once we do it, to replant it, and then to sell the production of those 100 hectares. This is why we called it Ventas de Vuelos. Del Futuro. We, the project is called in English the sale of future, pro, future um, production. This sale was innovative because in the second year already, in the second year of the program, we were able to plant the commercial uh, species. So by the year 2005, 2006, we left, we, we went to the Carbon Expo and the idea was to sell our, our production together with the private company and to promote this project further. There, the company Bosques Amazonicos, she merges with another international company and the English company that merged with, they decided not only to recover that 100 hectares and to sell the future production, but also to broaden the scope to 1,000 hectares. Why? Because there was an additional component that we hadn't seen it at the beginning of the project, and it was the forestry carbon produced. The forestry carbon is a, is a complementary to the management of the forestry and it helps also to, cons to conserve biodiversity. The carbon is not the objective of the main aim. The management of the forestry and the sustainability and conservation of the forest is the main aim. So what, was the, what were the pillars or the main, the main pillars? For, was first of all the scalability that it was also possible to replicate it, the financial forecast of, and the most important, the strategic alliances. Many times the ONG, the NGOs are afraid to work with private companies and we shouldn't be afraid. What we should do, we should work with the companies and in any alliances you, have, you need clear cut rules, the clear cut rules of involvement, as Herman well mentioned, and he is an expert on the issue, and we have to also to have those rules with private companies. So we have to set them. And that is the reason why once you have the rules of, of the game with private cooperation, first of all, is social equality, social inclusion, equitative or equal distribution of the profits, as well as the lessons learned. So this has all to be shared. In that sense, we were able to achieve, we were able to advance in the project, starting with this experience and this association, we, were, we recovered not only 100 hectares, but 1,000 with native forestry species, as you can see in the next slide that I'm going to introduce to you, that I'm going to show you, you can see the before and after, and look at the impact. You can see it right there on the screen on the left. You see the degraded area and on the right, on the left, the degraded area. That is not a forest. And on, on the left, it, it's worthless. It, it's, these are species which are worthless. And on the right side, there you can see the current status. We have 1,000 hectares with native forestry species. And besides that, the first project in, in this uh, reforestation project, we operated with VCS and CCB certifications, and we could also commercialize the carbon bonds. We were commercializing carbon bonds in this. Only in Ukayali, in the region in which we are working, we can replicate the project in another 100,000 hectares. The interpreter repeats 100,000 hectares. And another very important impact, uh, three weeks ago, the crops, the future crops has been, has been sold in the stock market in Lima, in stock market or in the futures market. So, and we have been able to commercialize it and to sell it 
in the stock market or the futures market, which is quite important for the forestry production, not only for the company, but for the country, Peru, because in Peru, we have close to 78 million hectares of forest that have to improve the quality of life of the people that live in the forest and in the surrounding areas. And starting with this association that I'm telling, trying to tell you and, and wrap it up and sum it up in a couple of minutes. And we are right now already going to publish it in the future. Starting with this experience of the association and the, we decided to get in protected areas in the national reserve and in the national parks that you see there on the on the screen. I mean, Puerto Maldonado, please allow me to tell you that the Peruvian state in the year 2007 decides to deliver some, no, to put up some of the areas in an official bidding process. And there the protected areas, the one that you see in Lila in purple, these are the national parks. And the green one is the National Reserve of Tamboca. And here you see also the areas of intervention. There we have approximately 600,000 hectares, which we can work with. And in those 600,000 hectares, we have the commitment to conserve the biodiversity of the area and to avoid, avoid deforestation of the protected areas. And as financial mechanisms, we apply carbon and our proposals. Once starting with the experience that we had had with the, with the, Amazon, in the Amazon, we were able to get into and start this experience. And why? Because the great driver of deforestation of the protected areas are not within the uh, protected area. It's more in the surrounding areas and the buffer zones. And if the people now see, the people that surround the area and live in the area, they see that the nature parks and the nature reserves are worth maintaining and they obtain some benefit. So with the carbon of this protected area, we are able to improve the buffer zones and to start projects once we recover the soil, be able to create agroforestal systems. And please, next slide, there we will see it. And we will see the impacts that we have achieved. So to culminate and to finish with my presentation, I got two minutes left. And to conclude and to wrap up, we can say that starting with this experience, we have been able, after this experience, we have been able to install 1,250 uh, hectares of fine aromatic cacaos, co cocos, in, and agroforestal systems. In order to do so, we opened up a cooperative. It's called Coparcel, which includes 275 uh, farmers, which, are, which, are, which benefit directly many families, 339 families, and then we have a primary, we are able to process 200 tons of cocoa per month. We have a processing plant. And we have also generated a microfauna you know, corridor for birds and mammals. And within these protected areas, we have been able to avoid deforestation of 30 of 3,730 hectares. So 3,730 hectares that we have avoided uh, the deforestation. We have also reached a conservation agreement between the cooperative, COPASER, and the national reserve authorities of the park. We have received a licensing of our brand, of the allied brand of, of conservation. And we are very proud and very satisfied that I can tell you, and we can tell you they have exported organic or biological cocoa of 78 tons to, to European countries and 352, 352 tons, which were, have been marketed under the fair trade seal. And this cocoa and this experience in, in, our, in the marketing has been able, and we have been able to reach, get all the certification. Other allies have come to us and different allies have come up 
the Fundación Exemple and other foundations which have a one tree planted and others which have come. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have been able to listen to me and to hear me and to, and, and in Peru, this, this experience started in Gambo Pata in the National Park has been already replicated by international conservation in the Bosques of Alto Mayo with a very similar model. And the NGO CIMA has also been doing it in the National Park of Cordillera Azul. So this is an alternative for around 20 million hectares, which I enhance of the National Service of uh, Protected of, of uh, Forestry. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, so thank you very much, Jaime, for a very interesting presentation. So your project definitely shows that you can protect nature while also achieving financial objectives and also social objectives if you implicate the relevant parties in the process and work together towards that common goal. And the results of your projects are really impressive. So great work. And I think even one of the participants left a very positive comment um, down there for you. So now I will hand over to Carla, Manager and Ecosystems Program in the IUCN Center for Mediterranean Cooperation. And then after her presentation, we will have a quick Q&A. So Carla, if you're ready, please yes. unmute yourself and take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thank you for, to Nadine and Ella for having me here. I'm Carla Danelutti. I work at the IUCN Center for Mediterranean Cooperation. But here I'm representing the MEET Network, which I'm also uh, serving as an executive secretary. So the MEET network is actually a network of uh, protected areas and local tourism operator, operators, which was formally established in 2018. And we work all together actually to conserve the region natural and cultural mosaic while promoting a new model for, uh, of ecotourism to the market through the development of specific and high quality ecotourism uh, itineraries and innovative tools to manage their impacts and monitor their activities. Next. So before we enter actually into the details of the network and let's say uh, the building blocks of it, uh, it's important that we understand in general terms, uh, what is the context of tourism in the Mediterranean and in protected areas of the Mediterranean in particular. So we all know that the Mediterranean is a cultural and biodiversity hotspot with very beautiful uh, scenery and beaches and, and places to be, but it's also the world's leading mass tourism destination. Uh, you can see in this slide uh, some data around um, the impacts that mass tourism is causing in the areas. We talk about that 50% of Mediterranean shores are actually urbanized uh, sun and sea uh, tourism being like one of the main drivers for it. Uh, tourism also, let's say, puts a significant pressure on uh, resources which are already scarce here at the Mediterranean destination. Some data here from a WWF report uh, where you can see that tourists use three or four times more water than residents. Uh, they contribute to more than 50% of marine litter here in the Mediterranean region. And on average, they produce double times uh, solid waste as compared to residents. Of course, we know that now, I mean, we are within, in the middle of a crisis that hit uh, the tourist sector particularly hard, but we, would, we could see already in this summer how, uh, let's say the COVID crisis is already causing uh, massification of natural areas, and there is an increase uh, in, uh, in the demand of actually going towards that type of destination. Uh, next, please. And in any case, we know that mass tourism is not going away anytime soon. After COVID, there's a strong interest in a fast recovery of the, of the sector, especially in the Mediterranean. And if all continues as expected, we are estimating over 600 million tourism arrival by 2030, which, which is a big number. Next one. 
So we saw before the overall situation of tourism in the Med, but in all this scenario, where do actually Mediterranean protected areas stand? Are they taking advantage of the opportunities of tourism are, or are they able to manage the threats caused by tourists correctly? Apart from some exceptions, uh, the majority of protected areas in the, in the destination here are facing several challenges concern, uh, concerning tourism, both from the management perspective, but also uh, concerning the non taking advantage of, uh, of the opportunities of tourists. And most of this is related with uh, actually lack of resources and capacities and incentives at protected area level to work uh, in tourism development is not a sector that they normally address. Uh, there's a big competitions and, and silos I mean, everywhere in the destination and even within the same country where same areas, let's say, compete uh, in, in the way they are presented in, in marketing. There's a lot of difficulty in meeting quality and sustainability expectations of uh, a different type of market that does not just uh, respond to, let's say, the typical sun and sea markets the Mediterranean looks for. And there's a, a lot of difficulty in actually reaching and talking with different type of markets, the target one that they are looking more at sustainability. And there is overall a, a lack of consistent guidelines and tools to make sure that uh, sustainability actually uh, of the offer is in place. Next, please. So given these conditions and this, let's say, starting scenario, uh, a group of conservation NGOs and regional authorities and parks actually decided to join forces in a cluster, is another, another name for a participatory, let's say, uh, planning grouping. We decided to join forces to support Mediterranean protected areas in creating sustainable tourism products and, and a, let's say, a related niche market experience and brand for the Mediterranean. Next. So the products that we uh, and the itineraries that we help protected areas to set up are based in and around protected areas. They work uh, only with local communities and with local service providers. Uh, the goal of these initiatives is to benefit conservation either directly or um, through, let's say, conservation actions within the, the itinerary or indirectly through uh, financial, let's say, um, contributions. And uh, another goal is actually to reduce ecological footprint and improve the behaviors of the uh, travelers in the Mediterranean. And uh, in, in particular, catalyze models of cooperative tourist development between parks and private sectors. And here I would like to uh, make reference to the presentation that we just heard about the importance that communities that live around protected areas do feel the value, the importance of, of them, uh, also from a, let's say, economic return point of view, so that they really uh, take active action in their protection. And this was a bit, let's say, also the core of what we wanted to do. Next one. So in a nutshell, the, the, the building blocks of the products that we set up and what made them uh, successful is that the, um, we have a clear and tangible product. It is also, let's say, an important aspect to include and involve private sector. The products that we do set up are run by a local tour operator, let's call it a travel agent or whoever has the capacity to put all these systems in, in coordination. We're not talking about individual uh, activities such as accommodation or, I don't know, an hotel or a restaurant or something, but we're talking about a multi-day uh, itinerary that puts together different types of uh, local suppliers and so that everyone has a representation into, into this uh, initiative. Uh, the core, uh, let's say, importance for us is the participatory planning. Uh, we have all the stakeholders involved in setting up this product, and in particular, the park and a local tour operator. Another aspect that is key, and let's say one of the part of the success of what we did was being market oriented. So making sure that, uh, that let's say there was a clear um, return on what we were doing, that we were actually uh, setting up a, an offer with, with a clear target and with a market and as well as distribution channels that uh, were, let's say, attractive 
to, to local private sector. And of course, what I was mentioning before, the sustainability and all the quality that we assess and monitor throughout all the process. Next one. Very briefly, I just wanted to, um, to share some lessons learned uh, concerning the involvement, especially of private sector in, uh, in our initiative. So as I was mentioning before, um, it's really important that uh, goals are clear and tangible, especially uh, with a clear economic opportunity if we want to have private sector on board. In our case, the opportunity was a specific ecotourism product, let's say, and the uh, opportunity of uh, positioning it in the market in the future. Um, something else we learned was that the perspective of private sector stakeholders has indeed to be uh, included from the beginning and in all the steps of development when we are talking about uh, businesses of collaborating in a specific, let's say, economic sector, it's important that we listen to the perspective of who is doing this uh, for a living, let's say. Uh, once again, I reiterate by the definition of a clear business plan post project uh, is extremely important, especially who's going to take the lead on that. In our case, we created an association, this mid network, who is operating as the secretariat of it. But it's important that there is a, a plan going forward that includes as well promotion and, and sales. Are we, how are we actually going to put this that we did on the market? Another um, learning that we had at this, uh, to make sure that every voice is heard and that we have an holistic vision beyond just economic benefit. As we heard in the beginning, every, every actor has his own, let's say, expectation and also ideas around the, the expectations of the others. So it's good that we all put on the table what we want to achieve. And another tip uh, that we would like to share is to make sure that, uh, and if possible, of course, to include the support of regional, national, or local tourism authorities or whatever sector we are targeting because um, they really support and can open um, the access to funding or to other, let's say, uh, resources that maybe small entities won't be capable of. And in our current case, of course, we never wanted to forget the core objective of our action, which was conservation and because we were operating with protected areas and parks. Next one. Just very briefly, I wanted to share with you some of the data of our network. I've been very, very brief in my presentation, but in all these links, you can find a lot of the materials we developed. We developed a manual, several trainings that explain step by step all the processes that we are uh, that I, I briefly explain. And in here, you can find all the other information. Thank you so much. All right, so thank you very much, Carla, for your excellent presentation. And I especially find that list of advice that you had um, in one of your slides very useful. So it's definitely inspiring to see how you were able to include and especially empower different actors who had different goals, so ecotourism and conservation together around one common goal that benefits not only them, but also just nature and people in general. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. So I see that in the chat, um, we have had some questions referring to individual context. Um, so hopefully you can use those um, in the small groups to discuss your challenges with your peers. Um, also, we can maybe go back to one question that was asked a little bit earlier. So maybe whether it's Herman, um, Carla, or Heme who would like to answer, but it's from Angus, I believed. Yes. Um, so his question is, is clarity of roles and responsibilities key in establishing partnerships moving forward? Are there any timelines when developing these MOU between partners that need implementing to exclude those not core to the project interests? So not sure who would like to um, address this question. Herman, I guess maybe because you talked about the general um, 
structure of MSPs in general, maybe you would like to address that? Um, yes, generally, yes, it's very important. Um, and the, on the timelines of the MOU, it's very difficult to be because it's very context specific, but indeed, um, not all the partners are often on the same timelines or need the same level of detailed agreements. Uh, so I find it hard to give very specific advice because I assume that behind your question is a very specific situation that I don't know enough about to really speak into. But um, yeah, I absolutely agree with your observation. I think it's very important. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so one question from Carla to, oh, Oh, yes, please go ahead. Can I, uh, can I make a question or, or no, I'm sorry, can I compliment the answer? Can I respond? Yes, yes, definitely. Please go ahead. In order to complete the response by Herman, there is a key word in the associate, associative world with private corporations. It's trust, T-R-U-S-T, trust. And as, and one, as we, we, you have to, as he well stated, Herman stated about legal issues, it's okay. But the important thing is trust. It's not a simple word. It's a process which is going to help you carry out the work in the future. I insist, I repeat, the trust in this forestry projects in protected areas are not short-term projects. These are medium and long-term projects. They can, nothing works on short-term. The company has to be aware of it. And this is a process which is being built in a joint fashion, step by step. And you, and you have to, sometimes you find bottlenecks and you have to overcome those bottlenecks and to, you have to find agreements. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for adding a complimentary to, to your question. So we actually had another question, but that is this one is for Carla. So did Meet establish a clear financial framework that everyone agreed to before signing up to it? And what conservation benefits were monitored? And did it just look at species, species population or environmental aspects too? So I guess that's two questions, sorry. Yeah. So Let's say that in every destination where we operate, we, uh, we establish a local ecotourism cluster that has the representation of all the, let's say, stakeholders that then are involved in the, in, the, in the offer. So within that, they agree on the way who is going to be, let's say, represented in the offer and how, how the, the agreement is distributed. So in that sense, I don't know if that answered the questions, but let's say that we leave that to the to the local scale, consider that we are mm -hmm. a network uh, higher up. Mm -hmm. And regarding conservation benefits that are monitored, we are specifically working now. We we identify define the standard that specifically looking at several aspects, including conservation and socioeconomic uh, impacts. Now now that I recall, um, at the moment we are broadly looking at mostly the governance of the protected area. So how tourism is, uh, let's say, sits within the protected area and we leave to the protected area to tell us the type of uh, indicators, let's say conservation indicator they are addressing. But in any case, I'm, 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 if uh, Angus, which I see that sent the question, would like to have more, more information and data concerning the standard that we are looking at, I'll, I'll be glad to share. Okay, thank you very much, Carla. Yeah, I'm sure he would very much appreciate it. So actually we're running a little bit late, so we're going to have to move on to the next section of our webinar, if that is okay. All right, so just quickly, um, just to let you know um, about Panorama Solutions. So just encourage you to visit the platform. There are many more great solutions like what we, um, the ones we've discussed today in different countries and landscapes, just like what you heard. So in English, French, and Spanish. And you can even also contact the solution provider directly if you wish. So for example, here we have three case studies, one from Mexico, another from Uganda, and then another one from Indonesia, but there are plenty more. So hopefully, 
after you feel inspired by these case studies, then you can contribute with your own. So now we're going to move on to um, the part that we're very excited for, which is the group discussions. So we wanted to provide you with an opportunity to discuss with others on the call. And no worries, it is with people who speak the same language as you. And so because this is what um, the BioBase Exchange and Panorama Solutions are about, which is connecting different actors for potential collaboration or just to inspire each other to action. So we are going to send you into breakout rooms shortly. Once you're in, we suggest that you begin by doing a short round of introductions. And by the end of the discussion, if you feel comfortable enough, you can even share your LinkedIn details or any ways to connect further. All right, so then you want to nominate a note taker. So right now, and I think Nadine already put in the chat a link to a Google Doc. So please click on it now so that at least one of you has it on their screen. And once you open it, please find the name of your group. You will see it once you're assigned to, to your group. So we have two questions that you can use to reflect on. So what are your main lessons from the presentations and how can you apply them to your context? So when we come back into plenary, we'll hear the main highlight from a few groups. And advance notice, we are expecting a few brave volunteers from the groups to share that highlight. All right, so Nadine, if yeah. you're ready. I think we're ready. So <laughs> it's the first time we've done it. It might be some of your first times. I've participated before, it's fun. You're gonna be sucked into a new room. I'm going to send a little message when we're halfway through, two minutes to go, and then you'll automatically come back. Um, if you find that you're not in a room or it's the wrong language, you can choose to leave the room and come back into the plenary space and we will be here to help. Um, but otherwise, it's very automatic. Enjoy the conversation, enjoy connecting, and see you in about 15 minutes. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I'm sorry to some of you who had uh, some technical issues there. Um, yeah, the important thing is you must have the most up to date version of Zoom. So I'm sorry for those who were not able to join the, the breakout room. And I'm sorry for those who were in a room that with people who weren't able to participate, but hopefully you had um, some good discussions in the end. I can see some um, nice uh, information being shared on the Google Doc already. So Ella, do you want to just take us through the last, the next part? Um, yes, sure, thank you. So yeah, we hope that you enjoyed your experience, that you feel very inspired and you know energized by your peers. And hopefully you were able to make some connections that will go beyond this webinar. So what we're going to do is to ask for one highlight from a few groups. Um, so starting with our Spanish speaking groups, um, please share one highlight from your group discussion. So please unmute yourself. When you're ready to speak. And please make sure that you are speaking in the Spanish channel. Hi, me hablas tú? Yes, we can hear you, Carla. ¿Quieres Jaime compartir tú? O, you're, o, you're o stop, stop, stop. You need to speak in the Spanish channel. I, I am. Oh, you are? Canal Español. Oh, see, sí. yes, I was on the wrong one. Sorry. You have to speak in the, yeah. Carla, are you still there? We can, can, you can speak. I'm going to do it. No. No, it was a great pleasure to share the few minutes that we had to speak, to converse. But I believe that my conclusion is that at least in, in the country such as ours, it's feasible and it's possible to contact to close those uh, al strategic alliances with the private sector and one and you have to have clear-cut ideas since the beginning since the outset social inclusion social e equality and in reality you have to know how the profits are going to be obtained and how they're going to be divided and to give you an example 
nowadays the forestry in protected areas is going to serve in Peru's case to act to finance mitigation action, ecological action, biological actions. And you have and earlier the forestry sector, they were talking about man, this is going to be difficult. And I believe it's a great message that we give that things are possible. The good thing is when we are speaking with Alberto about uh, Alberto from Honduras, Alberto Padilla, and they were commenting, they're on the same track, on the same road than us. And for us, it would be a great pleasure to provide them access to our web where they can and to share our knowledge because we would like that this model has success everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaime, for your insights. I'm really happy that you were able to discuss this much. All right, so if we could go to um, one of our French speaking groups, that would be great. I'm not sure we managed to have a French group in the end. Okay. Um, if, if there was, you can speak up now, but I, I think there wasn't a French group in the end. So we had a couple of English ones though. Okay. So any last call for French speaking groups? No? Okay. All right, so let's move on to our English speaking groups. Would anyone... uh, bonjour à tous. Oh, okay. Bonjour. Uh, bon, nous n'avons pas eu réellement uh, la chance de pouvoir uh, échanger. We uh, didn't have pardon. the possibility to... One second, okay. One second. Allez-y. I was saying that we didn't have the luck to connect very fast to exchange ideas among us. However, I observe that everything that has been presented here allows us to maintain contact in the future. And that, so that and I believe it will be able to replicate in other areas, in other areas of the world or continents. Asia, Africa, and this way to be able to obtain results. We also pursue those results in other countries. In Africa, it's quite difficult to carry out this type of activity. We need real support and consequent supports that allow us to experiment with these activities and those tasks also in the African countries so that we're able to replicate those in the African countries. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, so um, hopefully now we can go to next to our English speaking groups. Now, there were two mm -hmm. English speaking groups, so um, at least, so the, the ladies, somebody want to, from Eva, Anna, or Anik, just to share one, one highlight, and then we'll go into the final closing. One highlight from that discussion. Mm, and maybe you'd like to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you're unmuted now, Eva. But Anne has a lot to say, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, there's only one at a time for one highlight, though. <laughs> Go ahead, Anne. des fonds disponibles dans les entreprises privées, mais par ailleurs, il y a... And Annick was about to answer, and we were cut, so... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's okay, it's okay. That's that, that the only thing I had to, I, I, I had to say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your perseverance, Anne. If <laughs> one thing around that this making change happen, perseverance is a big lesson as well. So you had a tiny opportunity for that perseverance. Thank you, Anne. Okay. Yes, thank you so much to our 
um, participants. Um, so I believe that some of our sí. presenters. Uh oh, is... mm -mm. just keep going. Es posible una pequeñísima oh. intervención. It's yes. possible. Is it possible that I can say something very quick? Um, yes. One please. reflection. One reflection. One thought. Right. One thought for our sisters and brothers in the NGOs. When we speak about private sector investment, it shouldn't be considered a donation. It should be like a loan, like a credit. And that's the line that you have to work on. Paternalism and essentialism doesn't go, doesn't work. This hurts us more. What we are looking for is for the capacity development. The natural resources are going to be generated by private and the private companies will have to return some money. So the income, as an NGO, it, sometimes it is really hard for us to take that first step. Like the, we have to, in the IUCN, we have done so, and we have committed to, to this. And we can say it hasn't gone too bad for us because the important, the important thing in the forestry is ma forestry management and to guarantee and to preserve bioforestry and biodiversity. And this, and we have to be additional. So we have to work with the companies and we have to mm -hmm. look for common goals. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Heme. Um, all right, so thank you. Hopefully this was a fun and informative session for all of you. Thank you so much for your patience also um, with our technical issues. So I will now hand over to Nadine quickly to um, wrap up. Thanks. Yes, I'm, I'm quite sad now to get to this stage. It's, uh, it's the end of our last webinar of a series of nine. Um, I'm happy that our experiment almost worked. I think you can agree that the interpretation team have been fantastic. So thank you to Juan Carlos and Francis to help us behind the scenes. So there are, even though this is the last webinar, there are some next steps. Um, we are gonna send you a survey as we always do. Your feedback is so helpful to us. Um, we can still integrate it into future work that we do. Any ideas, if you would like to share a solution, use the, the survey form to get in touch. Please also consider sharing um, your a solution through Panorama Solutions as well. I heard quite a bit of experience as well, and I see in the notes. Um, so if you have experience on this, please do share on Panorama to get others to also be able to benefit from your experience. And if you'd like to continue to join the discussion afterwards in a virtual setting, we have a workplace group um, uh, set up. It's like a Facebook, but for work. Um, and you're welcome to join the group. So the links are all in the document. And and any questions, you know, get in touch. If you've got a success story to share, we'd love to help you share your story and help others learn from it. So let us know how you're inspired and you take action from this. Um, and then uh, I see everybody saying thank you and goodbye. So just for the, especially if Herman, if you're leaving now, thank you so much for for agreeing to participate uh, and share the amazing MSP guide from Vargas in university. Um, it should be a resource for everybody working in this space. On our side, we will share the recording with you um, next week, plus a summary of the discussion. We also have some resource pages, some, some overviews, like what Heme was saying, you know, we, we have to change how we think about business. Um, we've got some tools that we've gathered over the last year, some easy guides. They're in English and French at the moment. We need a donor for the Spanish. Um, and also we did a big survey of IUCM members recently, and we're just gonna be launching um, the, the results of that survey, which just show overwhelmingly that the conservation community, they want to engage business they know they're part of the problem but they are part of the solution and are looking for support so we're also looking for further support to be able to continue this capacity building and a peer exchange and learning but with that I think it's just yeah a final word for myself it's the last slide just to say thank you to all of you for participating today and uh, being innovative with us in this call um, thank you to the interpreters thank you to our speakers and um, a big thank you to Ella for moderating her first full session she did an okay. amazing job and um, and good luck for the rest of your um, your your journey working with business to, to get the conservation aims that we need so thank you and Goodbye. Bye. Bye bye. It has been a it was a pleasure, Nadine. Thank oh, you very much. Juan Carlos, it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank and you. everybody else.
Thank you. Bye bye. Nice Thank you. you. Bye. So I'm. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. Gracias. Merci bien. Felicitaciones, Juan Carlos, por la traducción. Muchas gracias. Éxitos. Merci tout le monde. Merci Carla. Merci Carla. A bientôt. Sí. Eh. Me he sentido muy cómodo. Merci, merci. Gracias. <laughs>